when I was 12 years old, my 15 year old brother and I experienced a very horrific event. When we were at our grandparents' cabin, my grandparents owned a cabin on a large island in South Sweden, which contains only two cabins, separated by slightly less than a mile. One summer, my brother and I, along with my mother and sister, went to visit them for a weekend. The thing we did most when staying there was to go fishing. On our first day of the stay, we set everything up, and all we had to do now was to dig for a worm, which was used for bait. Grabbing a shovel along with a bucket, we went to the back of the cabin and down a short slope and through a trail, where we would find plenty of worms. The forest is very dense and barely no light shines through, which makes the whole setting a bit unnerving for me, as I have always been easily scared. As we're walking through the trail, I hear something like walking, and I look at my brother with a very scared face. He just brushes it off, as if there was nothing to be afraid of, and says that we go check it out. We walk a bit further down the trail, which I know leads to an open meadow, as I have been there looking for mushrooms with my mom at previous occasions. Before we get to the open, my brother holds up his hands as to indicate for me to stop. I looked over his shoulder and see behind the trees what appears to be a moose just standing there. Looking directly at us, I was relieved as I knew they were friendly and as I had seen plenty of moose nearby. My brother, however, who has never been scared of anything, looks back at me with the biggest eyes I have ever seen and the most pale I have ever seen someone tells me that we should get out of here. Without asking questions, I start to walk back as he keeps pushing me as to make me move quicker and as we reach the cabin, we are pretty much running. My mom and grandma are sitting at the front doorsteps as we get to the front and I tell them that we saw a moose. My brother on the other hand remains completely silent. Safe to say there was no fishing that day. The following day we didn't even bring up fishing. I'm sitting on the porch reading a magazine and my brother is sitting inside the couch doing the same even though he still has that scared look in his eyes. I spend the following hour or two reading several magazines until my grandpa is asking where the shovel is. I realize that we left it when we were looking for the worm the previous day and I tell him where it is. Just as he is about to go get it, my mother tells me that my brother and I have to go get it since we left it there. She also tells me that we should dig up some worms as she wants us to go fishing later that day. I don't ask questions, but my brother seems unnerved by it. This made everything more eerie for me, as my brother is not really scared at all. He's actually pretty much the opposite of me. We put on our shoes and head to the back of the cabin and walk down the trail heading for where the shovel and bucket is. Once we're about 10 feet from where the shovel is, my brother stops and tells me I should go and dig as he did it the last time. I do as he says and I start digging for worms. I have this very strong feeling that he stayed back because he was scared something would happen. I start hearing the bushes around me sway and then I hear what you could call sneaky footsteps moving closer and closer. Everything is all the more creepy as I have no idea where the footsteps are coming from. One second I'm sure they're coming from my right and the next it feels like they're coming from the completely opposite direction. I quickly put the few worms I found in the bucket and as I fumble to pick up the shovel I feel as if somebody is watching me. My brother walks up to me and helps me seal the bucket and I tell him it feels like someone is watching us to which he responds that we should leave. Just as we turn around and are ready to head back I hear a crack behind me and turn around. I look down the trail and see the moose once again peeking at me from behind a tree. It looked very different from what they usually look like. At the same time I'm more confused and curious than I am scared and my brother is just completely silent. I can't quite see the whole body of it but I know that something is wrong. I stand for a couple more seconds watching it as it's staring directly at us. From what I can see, I realize that it is now standing on four legs, 
it is actually leaning as an old man with a really bad posture with his arms hanging straight down. I also had this weird sensation that this thing was trying to talk to me saying let me help you. In a few seconds I get struck with a panic and start walking really fast back to the cabin. My brother doing the same. It only takes a second before we are both in full sprint running back and I don't look back until we have reached the cabin. I turn around and the moose-like creature is nowhere to be seen. We put the shovel by the shed where we took it and bring the bucket with worms to the front where my mom and our grandparents are sunbathing. The day happens to go on as if nothing happened and we don't even speak about it. Ever since this happened, I have never brought it up again with my brother. We both just sort of knew that it would feel wrong to speak about it and none of us have visited my grandparents at the cabin since then. To this day, I'm not sure at all what I saw. I mentioned it to my friend once, and he told me that if what I saw was true, then it was most likely a Wendigo. He showed me some pictures from Google, and I instantly found resemblance of the creature that I saw back then. Until recently, I had completely forgot about this event, but after reading several stories about Wendigos, my mind has once again been haunted by this event and in a terrible way as I realized that what I saw was most likely something far more horrible than a moose. Out of all the things I have read about Wendigos, the most terrifying thing is the people saying never to talk to it. I am just imagining in my head what could have happened if I had tried talking back to the creature when I felt it was speaking to me. Alright, so some people asked me to share more about the events that happened when I was visiting my grandparents' cabin. I have not been there since then, but my grandmother and her new husband stay there every summer. Do take note that it was about six years ago since the moose incident. For those who don't know about the first part, the cabin is located in a very forest area in South Sweden on a pretty large island which contains only two cabins separated by a pretty dense forest. Through the magic of Facebook, I contacted my grandma. We don't know each other all too well anymore, so I didn't really feel comfortable calling her. I told her about the moose-like creature and how my brother and I both saw it. She then proceeded by typing for nearly 15 minutes and I waited patiently. Her reply was a full story of her own encounter with what she said she had hoped was just a weird, disfigured moose. Her writing was in Swedish, so I will do my best to translate it. About 20 years ago, I was staying at the cabin by myself. Your grandpa was working at the time, so I was alone for the whole week. One night, when I was sleeping, I woke up with an uneasy feeling. I wasn't sure why, but I just knew something was wrong. I had this feeling that somebody was watching me. My first thought was to fall back asleep, and so I did. I woke up in what I believe was about an hour, and this time, I was sure something wasn't as it should be. I felt the same feeling that somebody was watching me, and I could hear something moving outside. I grab a bedside candle and light it. As I get out of bed, I choose not to pull the curtains as I have this terrifying feeling that someone will be staring right at me. By now, I'm pretty much convinced that someone is trying to rob me. I was sleeping in a room at the back of the cabin, and so I walk up to the front and look out by the porch but see nothing. There are no neighbors nearby, and I can't call the police as I have no phone. I decide to go back to bed and try to sleep the fear away, and so I do. I lay there for at least an hour without falling asleep. And even though the sound is gone, the unpleasant feeling has stuck around. At the back side of the cabin, right outside of my window was an older cabin which we used before this one was built. The place was creepy, and we eventually decided to burn it down some years later. Anyways, I hear something bumping around outside of it, and I realize that I am actually going to have to look out the window. I get out of bed, light the candle again, and go pull the curtains. 
the uneasy feeling is still there. And I have the strongest feeling that something is going to be staring right back at me. I pull the curtains and for a second I'm in complete fear. I see something staring back at me. But it's no robber. It's not a person. It was a moose. I expected to be relieved to find that it was nothing but a harmless animal. But that is far from what it was. After some seconds, I calmed down and the panic faded a bit. This thing was still staring at me, but it was for sure not a normal moose. I took some seconds to investigate it. For a first, it was not standing on four legs. It was bending as if the upper front legs were just barely floating above the ground. It was also much more slim than all the others that I have seen. And it had this sort of disturbing twist in the body. The antlers just looked flat out terrifying. Naturally, it doesn't say anything. But I had this very strong feeling that it wanted me to come out. It wanted me to let it help me. Even though I felt that's what it wanted me to hear. I just knew that this thing had bad intentions. I faint within a few seconds and wake up at morning and let out a scream of panic. The creature is gone and I'm trying to figure out if I was dreaming or not. To this day, I'm not sure if this actually happened or if I was just dreaming. But now that I know you saw the same thing, I know it was real. My grandma suggested that I should tell my brother that I spoke to her about it and I am seriously considering doing so. I mean this for sure confirms that what we saw was not a normal animal. I had some thoughts thinking that it might just have been a handicapped or disfigured moose. But by the way that my grandma said it tried to communicate with her and convince her, he knew it was the same thing that my brother and I encountered as it too tried to talk to us. Apparently. She had already told the story to my mom and to my grandpa, but they just brushed it off and said it was either an injured moose or she was dreaming. Hearing about the story just made me all the more scared, but at the same time curious about what exactly the creature was and also what its purpose was. Was it trying to draw us into the forest? Was it actually trying to help us with something? Or did this animal want help? Hopefully, I will get more clarification the more that I talk to people about it. I ended up sending some pictures of Wendigo and Skinwalkers to her, and she definitely saw some comparisons between them and the moose-like thing. This definitely sent shivers down my spine. So to all the people reading this, if you ever encounter a weird-looking creature, deer, moose, or anything with antlers, do not speak with it or even acknowledge their presence. That's exactly what they want. I experienced something in the summer of 2013 that still haunts me to this day and continues to make me question everything. My girlfriend Anna and I had decided to go camping as a last farewell to summer and to get some alone time. She would be going back to school pretty soon and I wouldn't be seeing her as often. We had been together for just over two years and I was completely head over heels for her. I was even thinking about popping the question. So on a weekend in early August, I packed up my camping gear and drove 45 minutes away to the park that we would always visit. It was a nice park. It had a lot of trees and wildlife along with a small creek running through it. We knew the area well since my friends and family had camped there since we were kids. I ended up sending a text message to Anna after parking my car, letting her know that I had made it and I had set up camp in our favorite spot. You see. Anna had been caring for her sick grandmother all summer and her sister had finally agreed to watch her so that she could get away for the weekend but she had to wait for her sister to get off work around 5 p.m. that is. To save time I had volunteered to go ahead and set up. I went up the trail a bit until I found the spot we always camped at. It was nice and level and was right beside the creek. 
I immediately started setting up the tent. I wanted to get everything done so Anna didn't have to help. About 40 minutes later, I had the tent set up, our camping gear set out, and our sleeping bags unrolled. Everything was organized and cozy. I was in the middle of starting a fire when I got a notification on my phone. It was a text message from Anna. I have something to tell you, it read. Just as I started to text her back, I heard footsteps coming down the path. My body tensed up a bit because you never know what kind of people you'll run into in these woods. We had on a number of occasions met with a few drunks and the occasional rowdy teenager, but I soon relaxed as I saw Anna step out from behind the trees with a big grin on her face. I walked up and hugged her, scooping her off the ground a bit to make her giggle. I sat her back down and asked her what she had wanted to tell me. I love you, was the reply that I got as she planted a kiss on my cheek. Her voice, though, sounded a bit different and her lips were cold. I asked if she was feeling okay, and she brushed off the question and went to check out the camp. I gave her a brief tour before I went to go cook dinner. I made us each one of those prepackaged camping meals that you add hot water to. We had pasta and I opened a bottle of red wine I had brought. We sat around the fire eating. I tried my best to entertain her with some funny stories. The sun was going down, and I was having a great time. I watched the shadows dance off of her and the surrounding trees, and listened to the motion of the nearby creek. The daylight was almost gone when she said she was cold. I told her she could go into the tent to warm up while I cleaned up from dinner. She made her way to the tent, but not before giving me a smile and another cold kiss. I was starting to get worried about her. I wondered if she was getting sick, but I didn't want to nag her, so I didn't say anything. I busied myself with cleaning up after dinner, and it was there that I found Anna's plate of food that she had set off to the side on the ground. She hadn't ate a single thing. I also found her glass of wine nearby tipped over into the grass. This wasn't like her at all. That girl liked her food and the wine was her favorite. At this point, I was more than just a little worried. So I headed into the tent to ask her if she was feeling sick and I suggested that we pack up and get a motel for the night. But when I opened the tent and crawled in, I found her sound asleep in her sleeping bag. I contemplated waking her up so we could leave but she looked so relaxed that I decided against it. I went back outside and finished cleaning up camp and putting out the fire before I lay down next to her in my own sleeping bag. I had a bit too much wine and I fell asleep quickly. The morning came and it quickly filled the tent with a soft glow as I listened to the birds singing outside. Anna was still sound asleep, so I decided to get up and start breakfast. Fifteen minutes later, I was admiring the meal that I had made. Well, as much as you can admire, slightly runny scrambled eggs that came from a pouch. I peeked my head back into the tent to tell Anna that breakfast was ready. But that's when things got even stranger. Anna wasn't there. I didn't think it was likely that she could have left the tent without me seeing her. But maybe she had done so when my back was turned. I waited for a bit figuring that she stepped out when, quote unquote, nature called. But 15 minutes passed and I was starting to get worried. I walked the edge of our campsite and called for her, but there was no response. I walked to the trail and called out her name as I walked up and down the path each way. Still, nothing. I went back to the campsite and checked the tent, but it was still empty. I looked around her belongings, but it was then that I realized that she hadn't brought anything. I couldn't even remember her checking her phone last night, which is something that she was in the habit of doing while she was out in case her grandma needed her. That's when I grabbed my phone and decided to text her. I didn't have any signal, so I walked back up the trail to my truck where I knew the signal was good. That's when the text messages started flooding my screen. All of them, from Anna, my hands began to shake as I started reading. I have, I have something, something to tell you. you. It's, it's bad, bad news. news. Grandma, Grandma just passed away. away. Are, Are you, you there? there? Can you meet me at Grandma's, Grandma's house? house? 
I can't go camping tonight. I'm sorry. We can reschedule. Where are you? Fine. I'll be at my sister's house for the night. Call me. My hand started to shake so violently that I dropped my phone. My mind raced so fast that I had a fight to not pass out. I ran back to the campsite and searched everywhere, but there was no evidence of Anna or anyone else. I checked the tent to look at her sleeping bag that had clearly been used last night. I even checked the garbage bag to confirm that there were two plates from dinner last night, one with food still on it. I ran back to the truck and sent Anna a text message because I didn't trust my voice not to tremble. I told her I got very sick last night and couldn't text her back. I apologized and offered my condolences about the passing of her grandma. She texted me back letting me know she was okay and that I would see her later that day. I walked back to camp in a daze. My mind seemed to want to shut down. It couldn't process what happened. At first I thought I was going crazy. I thought I had a breakdown and imagined it all. But the sleeping bag and the dinner that she didn't eat told me differently. Who or what kept me company last night? Who or what could look just like Anna, but not be Anna? Had it been a ghost? Maybe a shapeshifter? Or was all of this just some kind of sick joke? I packed up camp with difficulty. My stomach was in knots and my muscles were weak. I felt like I was going to get sick at any moment. I made it home and sent a text message to Anna. I told her I was still sick and didn't want to make her sick. The next time I saw Anna was on the day of her grandma's funeral, where I easily passed off my anxiety about the whole ordeal as grief and sympathy. As I said in the beginning, I never told anyone the story. Me and Anna are now married, and I still haven't even told her. We don't go camping in those woods anymore. We have found a much nicer, and hopefully, safer spot to camp. I look back and remember that night, quite often. I replay all the scenes in my head, trying to find anything that will lead me to an explanation. But I haven't figured out anything. I do, however, no one thing. I spent the night with someone, or something, and it wasn't my girlfriend. For context, my tribe is the Kickapoo tribe. We're spread out through Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Mexico. I have family everywhere, but I live in Oklahoma. Our tribe still practices traditional ceremonies. That is to say it's all old school. Outsiders are not welcome, and nothing is written down. And we have several tribal members who don't even speak the English language or know anything about what's going on around the world. Anyways, when I was young, there was a ceremony that had to take place in Mexico every year. All families essentially have to make a trip down there. Out of respect for my tribe, I won't include exactly what happens, but it shouldn't matter. All that you need to know is my grandmother has a house down there that my relatives go to. There's a lot of us, more than the house can hold, Lucky for us, it's cheap to build over there, so my grandmother had a smaller house on that property. My family, my aunt's family, and my uncle's family were there. My grandmother is a superhero, so she is helping another group of family with their ceremony. Since the knowledge is all word of mouth, and so my mom would take care of our ceremony. The entire res in Mexico is located in the middle of nowhere about four hours drive from Eagle Pass. And once you get there, it's another two hours until you get to the property. It's really big, and there are mountains within walking distance. My grandmother's house are actually at the foot of one. There's no good stories that involve those mountains. It's actually considered a very taboo place. We don't go up there except to hunt. And also, a ceremony must be done for your protection if you have to go. I was maybe eight or nine at the time. My aunt lives in Texas, and my sisters and I don't get a chance to see our cousins very much. 
So these trips were the closest thing we had to family vacations, even though they were nothing but long work days. There is no electricity over there. As someone who grew up in pretty close to Oklahoma City, I sometimes forget how dark it can be when there are no cities nearby. No lights on the horizon, no cars on the road. Just finding the two small houses on the land can be difficult if no one has any fires going. There is a window in each room that is barred and the doors are made of steel. It's not pretty, but it's necessary since no one lives in these houses most of the year. The new house is different. The windows are still barred, but they can open. The old house windows were just solid glass. My sisters and I were playing with my cousin E and M in the new house. M happens to be my age and E is two years younger. It was well after sundown and the headlights on my uncle's truck was the only light. It was getting late and we, I say we but really just the parents, had a long day of work the next day. So everyone started moving for lights out. My family was in the old house. So my sisters and I headed to our room. And this event happened that night. I woke up to screaming. So did everyone else. You would think I would have been panicked but no. I was a kid who had just woken up by what was the sound of E. Screaming in the house. I wanted to scream at him to be quiet. I wasn't scared until my dad walked into our room and told us to stay. We don't disobey my dad so that's what we did. We went to the window and tried to watch outside. My dad was talking to my auntie and my uncle along with some of my older cousins were walking up and down the fence on our property with flashlights. It was too dark to see anything else. After an hour or so, we started getting tired so we went back to sleep. But the adults were awake until sunrise. I tracked E and M down to try to find out what happened. But E wouldn't talk about it and M didn't know. He said that E saw something through the window and that's when we all got a little creeped out. On the last day I asked my cousin G. G was one of the cousins who was walking up and down the fence that night. And as a kid he was something of a hero to me. He was a genuine tall muscle badass native. He told me what happened since my sisters weren't around. Apparently it was hot in the new house so my cousins had opened all the windows. E was sleeping on the floor next to one and woke up because of something touching his face. Apparently an old pale naked woman was sticking her head through the bars and was looking down at him. Her hair was long and gray and this touching his face is what made him wake up. He screamed and screamed until everyone came. After that, they looked around but never found anything. I was creeped out, but was pretty sure that E had just had a bad dream. So here I am a few years later. I haven't gone back to Mexico or Texas in a long time. I'm not really involved in the traditional part of my tribe anymore. My sisters have kind of taken over now. I still help when I can, but I have a pretty busy job. I discovered this community a few weeks ago and I thought about what happened with E way back so I thought it might make a good story here. Just out of curiosity, I called my mom to ask about it. Surely I wasn't the only one who had thought E had just had a bad dream. Why was everyone taking him so serious? I really wish I hadn't because now I have this feeling in my stomach when I think about it. She told me. This wasn't the first time the old woman had been seen, and G was wrong. They found her bare footprints going from the window to the fence, headed towards the mountains. Judging from the footprints they found, she had visited every window on the land. And mind you, it's in the middle of nowhere, in the pitch black. What the fuck? Okay, so I've been a skeptic of creepy paranormal things my entire life. 
I have never believed in that type of stuff. But the things I have heard, witnessed, and my grandparents' farm shakes me to my core. My grandparents own a large plot of land in central Missouri, and they have owned that land for around 40 years. I've been to that farm over 10 times, and every time I go, I always get this terrifying feeling that something is watching me. Like, there's always something behind my back. I have also had many strange encounters there that are downright bizarre. My first encounter with whatever the hell this thing was, was when I was around the age of 7 or 9. I'm currently 14. We had brought our dog named Spot to that farm. He was a silver lab who I loved dearly. I was exploring the forest behind the house, just enjoying the summer breeze, when my dog started growling. A deep, sinister growl that I had never heard him make. I turned around quickly to see what he was growling at, but I couldn't see anything but forest among more forest. While my eyes were scanning the area, of where my dog was growling, some animal shot out of the brush so fast I could barely see what it was and before I knew it, it was gone. I sat there for what felt like an eternity, absolutely flabbergasted by what I just witnessed. From what I could see of it, it looked like a coyote, but the speed at which it moved was absolutely insane. It moved like at 90 miles an hour and made almost no noise. But the most creepy part was that the place it jumped out of didn't even make an imprint of where it was laying. And from where I viewed it jumping up, I should have been able to easily see where it was hiding. Shocked by what I witnessed, I just decided that was enough and went back inside the house. My second encounter happened when I was around 10. I was visiting the place, and like usual, I was getting the feeling I was being watched. That first day was normal, and nothing really creepy happened. I was just spending quality time with family. But when night came, that's when shit started happening. I was trying to sleep in the twin bed that was shared by my mom's brother when he used to live there. That's when I heard tapping. Not tiny little taps, but loud tap. Almost like it was banging. It was coming from the direction of the window. I slowly sat up and looked at the window, but there was nothing. So I assumed it was just some animal or something like that. Five minutes passed and no tapping and I was drifting off to sleep when this time not a tap, a slam, a loud slam directly into the window. I'm not talking about like a hit, it sounded as if something absolutely massive hit the window. I shot up so quickly I nearly passed out. I decided enough was enough and grabbed the flashlight in the drawer and shined it out the window. Nothing. 10 seconds passed. Nothing. I was about to go crawl into my mom's bed when I heard it. A screech. A screech that was not achievable by any human. So loud it pierced the quiet peaceful summer night. I can't put into words what that sound sounded like but it was dark and horrible and I still remember it to this day. I froze, unable to move muscle. I was so scared. I was sitting there still as a statue, petrified by what I heard. That's when my instincts kicked in and they told me to run into my mom's room, which I did. For some reason, I didn't wake her up. I just cuddled up next to her and didn't sleep the entire night. 
All I could think of was that sound, that horrific, terrible, bloody screech. My next encounter was when I was around the age of 13. I was back at my grandparents, just enjoying my time, like I always do when my grandpa suggested that we go deer watching. I agreed because I had been doing this since as long as I could remember. And it was never an issue and it was extremely fun. So we took the Polaris and we went around 6 to 7 p.m. to look for deer. We decided to go into the most eastern pasture because that's usually where we spotted the most deer. 30 minutes passed and we had seen a few deer but not as much as we usually do. But then, this is where the shit begins. I get that feeling again. That dreadful feeling that something is there and the shadows watching me. But this time, it's a lot more intense. Like if it's right up behind me, but when I look, it's never there. But this time, it appears that my grandpa feels the same presence as me too. And just to let you all know, my grandpa is a very laid back individual, always joking and having a laugh. The only time I see him be very serious is when my great uncle died a couple of years ago. So when I started feeling that I'm being watched, my grandpa goes from a happy and laid back expression to very serious and alert. He gripped the wheel so tight, his knuckles turned white, and he was just looking around, like to make sure something wasn't following us. He then made a massive U-turn out of nowhere and started heading back to the house. I asked him, what are you doing? And he replied with, we're heading back to the house. The tone of his voice was cold, like he had witnessed someone being murdered. At this point, he was gripping the wheel even harder and was absolutely going pedal to the metal full speed back to the house. I decided not to ask any questions until we got back to the house, which we did in no time at all. Once we were there, he rushed me into the house, checking his back to make sure something wasn't there. When we were inside, he closed and locked the door tight. His behavior was very alarming and it really shocked me to my core. I then decided that all of the stuff I had witnessed was enough and I only asked them one question. What the hell is going on here? When I said that, he looked at me and gave me a cold expression and said, I have some things I need to explain to you. We then sat down for 30 minutes and he explained that whatever this thing was, it was living on his property and it has been here since the day he moved in and he and my mother experienced the same thing that was happening to me the very first few years of living here. He explained that he has seen whatever this thing is and it doesn't like new visitors. He told me about all the things he had witnessed and experienced and they seemed to have been very pretty similar to what was happening to me. He told me that he knew this was going to happen to me and that he was always watching to make sure I never got hurt because he knew this creature better than anyone else. We talked some more, but all of it was the same. It was now late and he decided that I couldn't sleep alone. So he had me sleep with my mom. We promptly left the next morning. I had not been back since that day. This last encounter isn't really an encounter. Two things have happened at my grandparents' farm. Recently, we brought my sister's horse to the farm. The first night for the horse was hell. My sister's horse has always been very friendly and not shy. But the first night of my sister's horse being at the farm was bizarre. The next morning, my grandpa woke up and was doing his usual chores 
and went to go feed the horse. He noticed that the horse was acting very weird, extremely shy and timid. But when he took a better look, he was shocked. The horse had three 10 inch gashes down its side, like something had clawed at it. It was ruled out that the horse ran into the fence, but I think otherwise. Also, around the same time, my grandparents adopted a dog and named it Panda. Panda was a Jack Russell Terrier who was two months of age. Five days later, he was found dead with deep puncture wounds on his body and with his neck slashed up. They said it was a bobcat or mountain lion, but I also think otherwise. Super creeped out by my experience I had over the weekend and curious what others think. I was driving through a rural part of North California, 30 miles from the nearest town. As I was driving down the road, a deer ran out in front of my car. I had no reaction time and I hit it at 55 miles per hour. It ripped my bumper off and the bumper was dragging under my car. I pulled over and called my dad for help. I then get out to look for a deer in the road. I know it was dead because there was blood sprayed all over my vehicle and I hit it square on. I walked around 20 to 30 yards away and I got an overwhelming sense of being watched. I couldn't find the deer so I turned and speed walked back to my car. It was around 7 p.m. and it was extremely dark. No other vehicles were driving by, no street lights, and barely any cell service. My dad was over an hour away, so I called a friend who lived a little closer, and he started on his way to me. While I sat in the car playing on my phone, I began to hear whistling and murmurs outside my car. I got chills, and the hair on my arms and neck stood up. There was one house to my right, but I didn't see any vehicles in the driveway or people moving or people moving around inside. I was on the side of the road by myself for 45 minutes and would occasionally hear these noises. I'm not sure what or who it was, but if anyone has any ideas, I would love to hear. I'm freaked out and I'm now scared of being outside in the dark by myself. Thanks. My roommate has told me the story a few times and I want to see if anyone else has had similar experiences. As he tells it, he was driving home super late at night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m. in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, both times that this occurred. The first time, he was driving alone on a road that has an open field to the left of it, when out of nowhere, a black figure on all fours bounds up out of the field, comes up out of the field, and across the road in front of his car. As soon as the figure got to the other side of the road, it stops with inhuman quickness, turns around, and looks directly at my roommate. He described the figure as looking simian, completely black, except for the face. The creature's face was a stark, white, human face. Not white, as in Caucasian, but white as snow. This happened again a few weeks later, but this time the creature was sitting in a tree. As his car approached, it climbed down the tree again with quickness, bounded across the road, 
stopped on a dime and turned around and made eye contact with him. This time, he had a friend in the vehicle who also saw it and began freaking out. It was the same exact thing as the first time. A simian black body with a snow white expressionless human face. My roommate, as always, the curious one, turned the vehicle around and began searching for the creature, but it was nowhere to be seen. While trading stories around a campfire, my friend recalled an encounter he had while serving an LDS mission. My friend's mission region had a reservation within its boundaries. However, it was far from where he was serving. On one occasion, him and his mission companion were told to travel more far than usual to meet with some investigators. This, however, took them near the reservation. On their way home, their car ran out of gas, and it wasn't until late at night that they were able to continue the journey home. My friend, who was driving while his companion slept in the passenger seat, chose a different route that took him through some back roads in an attempt to try to get home sooner. He told us he was driving above the speed limit when he noticed movement in the woods lining the road. Because coyotes were common in the area, he took little notice first. Then he looked out the window and slammed on the brakes. The sudden stop made his companion awake, who wanted to know what was wrong. My friend was shaken and said he would tell him once they got home. He only told him to say a prayer. By the time they made it home, his companion was dying to know what happened. And my friend told him, as I was driving, I looked down at the road next to the vehicle and I saw six men running on all fours, keeping up with the car. I was driving 40 miles per hour. This is my father's story, written from his perspective. When I was about 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone. A lot like our house now, it was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the Hymas festival and left us to tend the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs going crazy outside, thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance. We screamed at them to be quiet. We began to fall asleep and the dogs would not be quiet. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then, I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house except for my brother snoring. I then realized I needed to use the bathroom. So I woke up my brother to take me to the outhouse in the back. He teased me about being scared, which I was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs then began with their crazy barking out in the brush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first and I waited outside for him. While I was waiting, I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Then there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Everything went quiet again. It was way too quiet for that time of the year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I heard a few of the dogs by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little bit and then suddenly 
kicking one of them, making them scatter in different directions. The thing then looked up at me and I saw its face. It had a pure white face, like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began to walk towards me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was dark red, like the color of the blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of that outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed that this thing had long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move towards my brother. Finally, noticing this figure, my brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out towards my brother's head. When something finally snapped in me, I became unbearably angry. I broke from this trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became more and more angry at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had, I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull. Its smile now long gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the festival. After telling the story to my parents, they quickly hire a medicine man. Before I begin, I'm 16 years old and I'm a male. About three years ago, I was in Virginia visiting family over summer. We were right outside the DC area and staying in a two-story house near the freeway. On the other side of the freeway was a forest. So my mom, her boyfriend Eric, and I were all staying with Eric's parents. We had brought some night vision binoculars and decided that tonight was the perfect time to use them. So after dinner, we gear up and head out. We pass under the freeway and head into the woods. When we get about five minutes into the forest, we set down our bag and take out our binoculars. My mom looks around with them for a while seeing a few squirrels here and there. She gets tired of them and passes them to me. I look around for a while, being careful not to look at the freeway for fear of being blinded. I spot something behind a tree about 50 feet to our left. I concentrate on it, trying to figure out what it is. It looks like a pale, bald, anorexic man looking straight at us from behind the tree. I get a bit uneasy but I'm hesitant to believe it's actually there. I ask Eric to take a look just in case. To my despair he sees it too. He describes it much the same way I did. Now Eric, a former amateur boxer and I train MMA almost every day but neither of us wants to stick around with that thing we start heading back to the house crossing under the freeway we take another look behind us as a car comes by all three of us see glowing eyes 
lit up by headlights on the other side of the freeway. We say, fuck that, and head back to the house. When we get back, Eric's parents are asleep, and my mom and Eric go upstairs to the guest room. There's only one guest room, so I have the couch downstairs. I'm a little too excited after seeing the thing in the woods, so I end up staying up all night. Around 3 a.m., I'm watching TV and start hearing footsteps above me. I quickly remember our earlier encounter and panic a little. I try to calm down and tell myself it's just one of the dogs or maybe someone who couldn't sleep. I keep hearing the footsteps for a while until I hear a doorknob jiggle. I find it weird that they're trying to open a locked door but try to ignore it. They stop, walk around for a few more minutes and then it's quiet again. I stay up until the sun starts coming up and then pass out. My mom wakes me up and I remember the footsteps from the night before. I describe what happened and ask if one of them got up at any time. She says no and I think it must have been one of the dogs. That is until she tells me the room above me is the office. No one was in the office and the door stays locked at night. My heart sinks as I piece it all together. I don't know if it was that thing for sure, but I think it was. I'd done a lot of research, trying to figure out what that thing was that night. I found two creatures that seemed to match it. I think it was either a skinwalker or a wendigo. Whichever one it was, I'm just thankful that door was locked. I know I wouldn't be able to fight that thing, no matter how tough. I am. To start the story off, and to give a little insight about me, I'm an 18 year old female who grew up in Michigan and have lived in the country for as long as I can remember. And just a heads up, this is a long story, so bear with me. Now. Back to the story. On one hot summer weekend, me and a couple of friends, including my boyfriend, let's call him Tony, and my older brother, let's call him Brad, decided we were going to go camping for the weekend since it was such a nice warm week. Tony's parents had owned the cabin surrounded by a huge wooded area with a personal lake and no neighbors for at least four miles. But being stupid teenagers, we didn't really think about that. All we were ready for was to party like any normal teen would. Well, after being there for two hours, our fun had started. Tony's friends had brought tons of alcohol and weed to last us the whole weekend. So we wouldn't be bored since we had no service and only movies to watch. After it got around 12 a.m. and was pitch black, we had a huge bonfire going. It was a total of six people, including me and Tony. As we talked and laughed about upcoming events in our lives, we were so distracted that we didn't notice that my brother had literally frozen his eyes onto one section of the woods. Mind you, we were all intoxicated and high at the time. Eventually, our talking ceased when Tony realized his friend and my brother had an emotionless expression. Hey dude, you alright? He asked Brad. Silence. Brad didn't reply or even make any movements that would indicate he heard him. After that, I started to get scared as well as the other two girls there. It took a lot for my brother to act that way. Eventually, I was the first to catch on that he was excessively staring into a certain spot in the woods. I turned my head and followed his gaze the best I could. And when I finally caught on to what he was staring at, my heart dropped. There was, right fucking there, was, at first look, a dog. At least, that's what I thought. It was some person's dog that wandered off. 
But then, my brain kicked in, and I realized there wasn't neighbors for miles. So, how could there be a dog? My mind started to race while Tony still tried to get Brad to speak or even move. Then, in one motion, this thing stood up tall. And when I say tall, I mean fucking gigantic. It had to be at least six feet tall. Everyone now saw it. How could you not? The other two girls and the other boy with us were shocked as they finally grasped why my brother was as still as a stick. No one moved for what seemed like hours. Tony was the first to talk. No tell. He mumbled. No one heard what he said but Brad. And I swear to you, when I say his eyes widened as big as pan saucers, that freaked me out immediately. What did you say? One of the girls asked. It has no fucking tail. He hissed at her. My heartbeat stopped. He was right. There was no tail on this thing. My clouded alcohol mind cleared up in a fraction of a second when I finally realized what this thing was. Now I understood why my brother was basically shitting his pants. This thing was a skinwalker. My instincts kicked in right then and there. But before I could nope the fuck out of there, the thing let out a terrible stench like rotting meat before screaming inhuman-like. The sound was enough to scare the fuck out of everyone. My brother was the first up out of his chair and started shouting native words to the creature while I told everyone to get the fuck inside. No one questioned me when they saw just how dead serious I was, especially Tony. He's never seen me so scared, so he knew it was a bad situation. We all hightailed into the cabin, with my brother behind us, still shouting native words at the creature, which seemed to keep it at bay, while wow, it gave us enough time to get inside. He slammed and locked the door before turning all the lights off and grabbing a special ash from the kitchen counters and started throwing it at every window and door while chanting. Of course, he had everyone freaked out and basically in tears at that moment. After he was done, no one said a word for a long time, all of us still in shock. He grabbed our dad's pistol and had it posted by him for hours. Everyone was entirely shaken up to even question what happened. We must have fallen asleep eventually because I woke up to my brother packing all our stuff into the two cars early in the morning. I understood why. We had native family. We knew what we were dealing with and we knew it would come back and maybe not alone. Before we left, I did a blessing on the cabin and spoke a few calming words to the still very freaked out girls. We left as soon as everything was packed up. To this day, we still haven't explained exactly to our friends what happened that night. But they have also never bothered to ask us. I'll never forget that night. I am a park ranger, and that is all you will learn about me, aside from this story. During the summer of 2008, I had been assigned to a watchtower in the middle of a heavily forest area. Most nights, it was uneventful, and I tended to just read a book as I waited for my shift to end. However, this night, when I started my shift, the guy I took over from was shaken up, concerned. I asked what was wrong. All he did was shake his head and said, there are things in the woods. He didn't say anything else and just left me standing there like a jackass jerk. Well, I set up for the night and took out my book. It was the mailman, and I found myself surprised by how much I enjoyed it. 
sometime around an hour into my shift. Something struck the window. I jumped up and quickly sat the book down. Before checking it out, I had expected it was either a big bug or some poor bird. It was a bird alright, but not what I had been expecting at all. This bird was dead long before it had collided with the window. Both wings torn right off and stripped of all feathers. It was bound together with straps made from long grass blades. This was the clear evidence that this was man-made. I quickly took out my flashlight and began scanning the area beneath me. I couldn't see much through the woods. However, as I did a quick double take, I swear, I saw a dark shape dart away from the light. I feel this needs some elaborating. I could barely make out anything. But when I brought my light over this thing, I only got a brief glimpse. I literally couldn't describe it for the life of me. This thing was fast. Too fast. Alright, listen up you punks. If you're out there, show yourself right now. I used my most commanding voice possible. Nothing. As I drew my pistol, I heard the radio crackle. Naturally, I went to check and picked up the receiver. As I held it up to my ear, I could only hear static. So, I at first assumed there was a glitch. But right as I decided to set it down, something stopped me. Call it intuition, something just wasn't right. And then, I realized what it was. I could hear something over the radio. It was faint, so I really had to strain to hear it. Slowly, I could make out what sounded like faint, low humming. There was a pattern to it. A steady beat that started low, building up, then carefully dropped back down in an instant. I don't know how long I was listening to that humming sound, but eventually I turned off the radio ready to radio it in. Then I realized I could still hear the humming. Without a second thought, I drew my pistol and turned around on my heel before steadily walking back outside. That humming sound sounded like it was all around me. Following that same pattern, I still had a strain to make it out, but there was no question it was there. I swiveled around, pistol aimed at empty air. Every part of me was screaming to call for backup, but I wasn't sure what I needed backup for. I needed some proof of what I was dealing with, so I waited, on guard and ready, and then it stopped. As I became accustomed to the silence, I couldn't hear anything, not even a bug chirping. Cautiously, turning my flashlight back on, I pointed it down at the base of the tower. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Then, I heard a creak. I immediately spun around, processing this information. At first, I dismissed it as the wood, but then, there was another creak. And another Something was up here with me. It took me a few moments to realize that it was just around the corner. In that moment, fight or flight kicked in full gear. And I chose fight. I rounded the corner and found nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was nervous, but I still had a job to do. And with no other option, I decided to call for backup, which I should have done that a long time ago. I realized that when I saw the receiver had been cut right off, I stared, dumbfounded by a few moments before grabbing my walkie-talkie instead. But when I turned it on, all I got was a harsh whine right in my ear, which caused me to drop it as I recovered. Once I had 
I immediately tried to find it, but it was gone. My situation was desperate. I was now completely cut off with some thing or other that seemed to defy all sense. If I was going to make it out of this, I had to stay put and wait for someone to come check on me. I still had my pistol drawn, waiting and waiting. I then quickly shined my flashlight outside one last time. And this time, I finally saw them standing among the trees, staring up at me. They had been avoiding me all this time, so to see so many of them, you might be wondering what they were. And I'd rather not tell you for my sake. I was at my limit then and screamed, turning off my flashlight and pointing my gun right at the door. There, I stayed for the rest of my shift, unwilling to move from that spot. I consider it a miracle I lasted for the rest of my shift. By the time someone finally arrived to see why I wasn't checking in, I poured out every single thing I had gone through. At first, the other ranger looked at me like I was crazy, but when he asked if I had any proof, something landed on the roof of his vehicle. It was another dead, naked, and wingless bird wrapped in grass. Needless to say, we booked it right out of there. When I got back and made a report about what happened, I demanded to speak with the last guy who had been on the previous ship. I really wanted him to have it for not warning me of what was out there. But here's the thing, we never found him. We searched high and low, checked every single record for a trace. We tried to look up his name if when we could remember it, but it seemed like he never existed in the first place. So, what the hell took his shift? I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and it only takes about 25 to 30 minutes. I have made this trip dozens of times and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way so I'm not scared or on edge. There is a patch of forest however about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was 10 steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound, the one that screams there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around? and book it back to my friend's house. I didn't know the best option in this situation, so I whispered, hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips, I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there, so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice, hello? My heart pounded against my chest I felt like I was going to faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. 
I couldn't reply. Hello? 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 As my voice echoed over and over from a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale. And I realized, for the first time, that there was no typical forest sound. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets. Nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I had enough and was wielding my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard some rustling in the bushes 20 feet to my left. I watched as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush as it came further out and stood up on twos. I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, lay down, and thought about what happened. My mom came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I was afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. But this terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds got quiet. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature that they called Yi Naudroshi, or he who goes on all fours, or a skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required and that this witch had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me and that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name, but drawing it out really far, like, Amy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the door and let it into my house. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. 
Is this thing seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. Many of you who love paranormal stuff may have already heard of the word Nagual here in Mexico and I would guess that also on some other countries in Latino America we call that way people who can shapeshift into animals. Well here's my story. It was a cold night. I remember because it was really weird for it to get cold on that side of the country. This was in my parents' house, in a small pueblo, or small town. And back in the day, it was one of the last houses outside of town. Not so many neighbors, but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard, where we used to have sheep. At one side, a small water stream, and trees to the other side. The sheep then started to bleat very loud, something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on a window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly, and in a low, urgent voice, he told my mom, Ve agarra a tu padre y a tus hermanos y diles que vengan ya ahorita. Go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell us what he saw. In the barn, we had 10 sheep. At the moment my father gave a look, all of them were together in just one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense. But he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one sheep there. This one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep us inside of the house and to keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. So he made some kind of prayer holding his machete. So his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. He then went outside. That's when my grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Vete de aquí. No tienes nada que ver aquí. Deja esta casa. Go away. You have nothing to do here. Leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming, by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and raise its head up towards my family. This thing was only staring at them. Not a single noise and also no red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock. He picked it up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation, but I guess this thing was not that strong. Or maybe because it was six of us and we all had machetes. But when the rock hit it, this being turned its back and ran away to the forest, running on all four legs like an animal would. They then approached the sheep and my grandpa said how the sheep was on the ground but it was still alive, but it was completely unskinned. It was horrifying at least. My grandfather then sacrificed it to stop the suffering. After that night, a family friend told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was a Nagual. He told us he spoke to that man and he told him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar after that. I saw some videos about skinwalkers 
on TikTok. So I started watching videos about them on YouTube. And there was a whole podcast where this guy just read stories about them from Reddit and other stories that people submitted. Our ward at church purchased a piece of land way back in the day. It's seriously just wooded area with a little bit of swamp. We would always go there for campouts and scouts. And at night, when it was pitch black, we would all play manhunt. Well, one time, we all got down to one person whose name was David. Growing up, he was super fast, and he would hide really good so nobody could ever find him. He would always end up being the last person. Well, one time, it was down to David, and we had split up and gone way deep in the forest towards the swamp because it seems like it was impossible to find him. We thought he might have gone a little bit further than we normally go. We started getting into some more muddy and wet terrain as we get closer to a swamp-like area where the water is most likely shin deep. And we saw David way out in the swamp and he wasn't wearing a shirt. And with the spotlight on him, he looked super pale, but he just stood there and didn't say a word. You could seriously tell something was off. Then, all of a sudden, we heard David from behind us, yelling, trying to get our attention, so we would keep trying to chase him down. Meaning, what we saw in front of us was definitely not him. So being a bunch of 12 to 17 year old boys, we started yelling and running back to the campsite as fast as we could. Nobody believed us. In fact, for years everybody made fun of it, calling the ghost of David. But then I started listening to these stories and every single one of them sounds just like what happened in some way or another. I am Navajo. We had an incident with an unwelcome visitor in our home. Here's what happened. My cousin is sleeping over. He's the same age as me. We're both 13 at this time. We're in my room talking and hanging out. It is around maybe 11 p.m. It is a pleasant summer evening. So my window is wide open. It's also pretty dark outside, and my dad is in the living room watching TV. But as always, he's dozed off on the couch. My mom has already gone to bed. My cousin and I are keeping it down, but we're not ready yet to call it a night. All of a sudden, we hear the screen door to the front of the house open and slam shut. We think it's my dad. My mom. She tells us the next day she hears footsteps on the carpet. Whoever it is, she says, goes through her room and towards the bathroom. So she naturally assumes it's my dad. Then she realizes that she's unable to move, as if she's paralyzed. Still, in my room, my cousin and I again hear the screen door open and slam, only this time more loud. It wakes up my dad, and he comes to my bedroom to check on us. Finding us both there, he wants to know which one of my friends just slipped out of the house. It takes a few minutes, but we convince him we were by ourselves, and that we thought it was him going in and out. I can see by the look on his face, he's not really buying it. But he has to admit, we don't seem to be lying. He then leaves. And as he's closing the door to my room, he tells us to stay out of trouble and go to sleep. All we could do is shrug. The next morning, my mom tells us about what she heard and how she could not move. She also tells us that the second time the door slams, she then hears what sounds like a horse galloping by her bedroom window. 
She then has all of us pray. And now, every year, we hike up the mountain to a high point and we pray for protection from evil. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona, within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation, were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limp, and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house, and they summoned the local medicine man, who came and said some prayers over him, but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and blessed the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body. I was only 17 at the time. On this specific night, I woke up feeling thirsty. I'm just lying there, staring into the dark and deciding if it's worth the effort to get up and get something to drink. I'm sure we all been in that situation plenty of times before. So tonight, when you're in bed and you're questioning if you should get up and get some water, remember this story. So all I can hear is the clock ticking down the hallway and the muted silence. It's just way too quiet. I checked the time on my cell phone. It's a few minutes short of 2.30 a.m. I then decide to sit up and get out the bed. I then make my way towards the door of my bedroom. It's really dark. I go down the hallway towards the kitchen. As I get out to the living room, I chance to look to my right and in the direction of the front door to the house. The only light is coming from a street light that is down at the end of the property and not all that far away. There. At the inside of the door, inside the house, I see this figure standing there. Its face at first appears human, then serpent-like, and then 
back to human, as if it can't decide how it wants to present itself to me. For some reason, I'm just standing there taking this all in. I'm not afraid. But I don't feel like I have any control over my senses either. And I'm not sure if I could move or have said anything, even if I wanted to. Which at the time, I can't say I did. As the two of us are standing face to face, he assumes his human features. His face is fully painted, a thick stripe of black across his eyes and the rest white. He has a feather woven into the hair at the top of his head. He looks young, not much older than me. He is bare chested, not real muscular, but definitely cut. His torso is painted red. His lower half is covering what looks to be khaki colored pants, well worn and faded, cut off and frayed just below the knees. He is barefooted, but his wrists and ankles are wrapped with animal skin of some sort. It is hairy and light, colored like that of a coyote. He doesn't say anything to me, not aloud anyway, but I do hear his words in my head, although for the life of me, I can't remember any of it. It's as if he at the same time, with this cold stare of his, is pinching away layers of my memory. I do remember wondering why he is in my house and having the idea that he was expecting to find someone else. Just then, without even thinking about it, my cell phone in my hand, I begin dialing 911. With the phone ringing, I look back to the painted stranger. He gives me a thin smile and vanishes through the door, which by the way is closed and locked. To the other side, I hear what sounds like a horse galloping away. I move over to the door and pull it open. I see this figure taking long strides across my yard, away from the light and out into the street. There's a car parked on the other side. He goes around to the passenger side, ducks down and into the car, and it drives off. It all happens in a matter of seconds. I then realize there's a police operator talking back to me from the phone. I tell her there was someone in my house, but I leave out the part about his changing appearance and leaving through a closed door. The operator, or whoever she was, tells me not to worry about it. She says that I'm not the first caller of this kind on this night. She tells me to say a prayer, telling me that she too is Navajo and to go back to bed and that I won't be bothered by it anymore. Before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course the wildlife that we would see. Now. I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. 
I always felt safe when I was there. Like, nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone, down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats, with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there, and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people, as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me sugar booger that being a nickname she gave me since i was born that's what i had heard but it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick sugar booger i looked up where i heard it coming from which was from the woods but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck even at the age of six it didn't feel right, so I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner, and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. 
I rolled onto my side, trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar booger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken, but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep, and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then, I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw. That if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again. But this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it. Then to me, she then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17. 
many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas. Them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there, but as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby. But I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only 9 at that time. And being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened, and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was, that same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile, only this time I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting, the smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage, its limbs were much too long for a normal fox, the back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it, but now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was, too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found Found you. you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, 
who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented? by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions and that's what really scares me. Now I have long moved from California and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods but so far that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night about anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared a laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I reply, taking a sip of my beer. Well, I hope it's gone because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him, said Alex. He sounded 
a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods. What the fuck? I said, shaking. We began shouting for him, following the trail. I was the first to see him, standing in a clearing about 10 meters away. He was facing away from us. We tried shouting, but we got no response. We walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too, as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us and we saw his face was literally hanging off and underneath was pale gray skin. We could also see a burning orange eye and part of a wide mouth with long sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jim looked normal aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on and there Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car, parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered, and last I heard, he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him, as I'm pretty sure I saw Jim a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner, but I'm an old man now and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker, and it may have found me after 40 years, and I think it wants to finish the job. And now it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend, Jim.